Right, uh, let's start. Uh, thank you all for coming. Um, this is the information event to the, the one of the calls of the eScience Center for this year. Um, we'll explain there's actually another call uh, for which there will be an information event uh, next week. Um, if you have any uh, questions, we have a Q&A session at the end. So we can actually use this to, uh, to answer your questions. We won't be recording that, but we will be recording this. Uh, if you have any burning questions uh, uh, that you really think cannot wait, please put them in the chat and we'll try to, uh, to answer them uh, during the presentations. Otherwise, uh, most questions will actually uh, be answered uh, at the end. Um, and uh, the first uh, presentation we'll have is by uh, Joris van Einaat, or our director. We'll actually be explaining what the eScience Center is and uh, why we have calls and what the purpose is. So take it away, Joris. If you have any, uh, if you want to go to the next slide, just say next. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Niels, and um, uh, welcome everyone uh, uh, to this information event. I want to tell you a few things about the eScience Center, about the kind of people that work at the eScience Center, about the way we work, and a little bit about the calls, and we'll go through that. Uh, quite rapidly, I think. Um, so I'm the first bit, Netherlands eScience Center introduction and purpose of calls. So if you could go to the next slide, please, Niels, then I will get started with the, uh, answering, trying to answer the question, what is the eScience Center? Now, the eScience Center, in a nutshell, is the national center for uh, ex of expertise for research software. So um, the eScience Center was set up at um, somewhat more than 10 some say 11 years ago, um, as a research organization by uh, the Dutch Research Council, NWO, and by SURF, the uh, Dutch Infrastructure Organization, um, with the task to uh, keep the Netherlands at the forefront of international research insofar as it uh, concerns research software. So basically, that is what we do. We build research software for researchers. Uh, so we have the the this kind of a, 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 the circle is, is is connected in that way. Uh, the eScience Center has researchers who work with other researchers to build research software, um, and this we do this through all the disciplines. So no no matter what the research question is, we should be able to deal with it. And if we can't deal with it immediately, we'll find someone who can. Uh, so we move through all the uh, all disciplines. Uh, we're there for all research institutes, universities, and research institutes. Um, and what we do is, you know, try and uh, build the research software where researchers are enabled to do that themselves. So the, the, the words research and advanced, advanced digital technologies will crop up time and again in my, uh, in, in my talk. The uh, eScience Center is an independent foundation, uh, so it has its own board. It's independent from uh, NWO and SURF, although the sponsors uh, are uh, financially are uh, and DBO and SURF who get their money uh, then again from the uh, from the Ministry uh, of of Education. Um, I'll come back to the research software engineers in, in a moment. Um, perhaps in, interesting to keep in mind is that we have a strategy which, if you're interested in strategies, you can actually read. But the next slide will show you a brief outline um, of that strategy. So if you could go to the next slide. Then there's a, um, a diagram on the right hand side, which has a vision, mission, strategic priorities and so on. That may not be the most interesting stuff. What is interesting, perhaps at least to keep in mind, is that the eScience Center has two ambitions under the current strategy. One ambition is to um, make sure that there are, uh, is enough um, training, um, a supply of training for people, uh, researchers who are interested in being trained in advanced uh, technologies. So think uh, of machine learning, uh, parallel programming, optimization, that kind of stuff. Um, uh, that's one ambition. So training uh, is kind of our outreach activities. The other ambition are the projects we have, and that's what we are discussing today. So uh, collaboratively designing software for research. And in this scheme, ambition one, we have several uh, calls. Um, one of which is being discussed today. The other one, Niels mentioned the other call just a moment ago, is for sustainable software. The information event will be next week. But we have more calls, so I would encourage uh, anyone who is not yet subscribed to our newsletter to subscribe, because that is a, a very good way to get all the information you want from us, uh, whether it's about calls or about the training or about other activities we have. We have fellowships, for example, which is another interesting activity. 
um, uh, then please do subscribe to the uh, to, to the newsletter. That can be easily done through the uh, website. So on for today is the open e-science call, uh, which goes under the slogan, empowering researchers through di digitally enhanced research. So uh, that basically speaks to our vision and our mission. We want to empower researchers uh, at research institutions to be able to do the things uh, that we do, and we'll help them there. Uh, so next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is an important uh, question, <clears throat> which I'll try to answer briefly is, how do we work? Because um, the calls we have are special calls. They're not the regular uh, calls you will find uh, at the Dutch Research Council or Horizon Europe. Yeah. One thing, one important uh, difference is that we do not have a cash flow. So we do not uh, offer money. And there's no in, in cash component in the calls. We offer expertise. That is why the eScience Center is a center of expertise. So we, we, uh, we offer in-kind support. And that's basically the capital we have human capital. These are research software engineers who have a lot of expertise. And we do that. And these are researchers in their own right. They are experts in, 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 uh, in digital methodology, if you like. And they collaborate with other researchers. And those other researchers are you know, the larger part of the audience today. That's why you're interested in, in, in this call as a researcher. So we have different kinds of projects in different size. And um, the, the, the projects are all, all about collaboration with um, software methodology on one side and a research problem on the other. And we try to bring that together to, um, to solve that research uh, problem. So always driven by research challenges faced by project partners. We try to apply state-of-the-art solutions. So this is what you can expect from us. And we have um, a number of people in the eScience Center who uh, guard uh, our technological knowledge to make sure that's up to, uh, up to date and uh, on par. Um, uh, one very important thing uh, for us is open science. So the reusability uh, of software in our case, uh, the fact that software is always open, um, but that doesn't apply only to software, but you know, to all the knowledge, publications are open access, uh, data is open and so on. Um, and we encourage software sustainability, which is also for us a part of uh, the open science, our open science program. Uh, but software sustainability is, is very important. And what we try to do is build communities around software. And the, the calls, uh, or the, this call reflects that, um, that ambition too. So that is the way we work uh, very briefly. Um, but let's go on to the next slide. And there we get the workers. So these are the collaborators on our side, research software engineers. That is a, uh, an Anglophone term that doesn't quite cover what the research software engineers are, but it, we don't uh, have a better term uh, at the moment. So um, this is the term we use. The, the, the thing is, these are specialized high-end researchers. Most of our people have PhD in some of the other discipline, in a whole range of disciplines at the moment. Uh, so that means that, you know, taking them all together, we have a very broad orientation. That is why we can cope with, with most questions from most disciplines. Um, and all these people have had um, a career uh, experience and also an internal training um, to develop a uh, strong affinity with, with ICT so that they can really give you um, the state of the art uh, software. Uh, so that is, it works on both sides, right? We, they, they understand the research question on the one hand, but they also are knowledgeable about the ICT solutions. That, uh, are around in the world today, and they can apply them. So they are experts in technologies and methodologies, but they also know how to engineer uh, software to make sure that it's um, high quality software, which we uh, deliver to you and to the world through you. And we have uh, about 70 or 80 people at the moment. I tend to lose count, but it's somewhere in that order um, of uh, people working at uh, the eScience Center We've grown rapidly over the past three years, and uh, in total, about 100 people are working at the eScience Center, but a large portion of this, um, about three quarters, are research software engineers. And yes, the next slide, please. Um, so this is the object, objective of the, uh, the Open eScience call, as it is stated in the, uh, in the call text. Uh, and again, you see the words research and advanced and community crop up, and uh, that, that is kind of, uh, again, in a nutshell, what this call is about. 
So um, you need state-of-the-art and innovative uh, solutions to your research. Uh, we can provide that. So it's advanced research software is what we can help you with. Uh, you need to give us an urgent challenge, and that is also one of the criteria which uh, a proposal will be measured by. There needs to be a, an urgent research question, a content-driven research question from your side, which can count on broader support from the research community, and th this is important to us. So uh, this also makes the software that we make um, uh, as sustainable as we can um, make it right it needs broader support from the research community too it has to have a landing place beyond the individual uh, applicant that's what we are looking for uh, to increase the uh, sustainability of that research software and then i think the next slide is the last one and that is just a few bullet points about um why the open e science call or at least why we think it's special so in in, in itself it is already a special call right so this is has to do with the um, the differences between the normal calls you find at the Dutch Research Council or to Horizon Europe, because it is an in kind, um, fully in kind um, call. So what you get is expertise, not money. Um, we need a non technological research question, so uh, a, a, a content driven, uh, disciplinary research question from you, and that sets it apart from the sustainable software call, which will be um, uh, talked about. Um, next week this time um, but also important and you will have found this in the call text if you've read it and people will be talking about this later on or you can post questions about this um, there is an in cash component but that is not a cash flow to you but it is the uh, um, the, the uh, idea that you can and should and must organize a workshop in the um, context of the project if it is awarded to help build a community around the software. But that workshop will be fully financed by, by us. So um, that's in this sense, we are investing money, but uh, again, there will be no cash flow. And that is to increase sustainability, increase the impact of the software we're build, building in your project. And we hope we have a simplified, a relatively simple application procedure. It used to be more complicated. Um, uh, this will be discussed later on. Um, but if you have any feedback on the application procedure itself in due course, once you've experienced it, um, that would be very welcome. We always um, welcome uh, feedback. Um, so that's it for me, Niels. I think that is the last uh, slide, in fact. So um, I just want to uh, encourage everybody to, to submit. And if you do submit, I really wish you the best of luck. And I hope that you will become a, um, a member of the extended eScience Center community. So thank you for your attention, and that's it for me. Over to Niels. Thank you, Joris. Um, yeah, after that, a very nice introduction to the eScience Center. Uh, now I want to give an overview of the of the call itself. And I want to mention that uh, all my slides are pretty much literal quotes from the call. So if you uh, are in doubt, uh, uh, you can always look, uh, look this up on the call. Uh, there's information on the website as well, uh, or you can always ask. Um, um, so this is our current uh, call for proposals. Uh, so we have two, the, the other one will ex be explained in more detail uh, next week. Um, and um, I'll now go over all the practical uh, issues uh, and the uh, practical rules. So the first one is who can actually apply for this? Uh, we have a, a lead applicant, um, which is basically the person who submits the proposal. And uh, we have a number of rules. Um, I think they're rather straightforward. Um, but you have to be affiliated with the Dutch Research Performing Organization is the first one. We're the, the, the Netherlands eScience Center. Uh, so although we really like working internationally and also with groups of researchers, the lead applicant has to be somebody uh, from a Dutch Research Performing Institution. Uh, there's a, if you are in doubt on, uh, on if you qualify, there's a list at the end of the call. Uh, you have to have a PhD. Uh, and um, this call actually has uh, two different targets. Uh, um, it's actually made out of two, two different uh, um, target groups. Uh, there's the spearhead projects and the early career projects. I'll get into the differences later. But one of the differences is that for the spearhead project, these are the, the larger projects, uh, we need a permanent contract or a tenure track position. This is also uh, already uh, uh, OK. Um, but for the, 
Early career projects, we don't have this requirement actually. So the only requirement there is that you actually have a contract that extends to the end of the project. So I think that is actually uh, quite unique also for a call. Uh, most calls, uh, you, know, you need a permanent contract and uh, that's it. Um, you need knowledge and experience in applying digital methodologies to research. So really want to work with people that have uh, some idea on, on what digital research means. And it doesn't mean you need a PhD in computer science and you're an expert at uh, everything uh, surrounding programming and software quality. That's also why you ask us. But we do ask you to have some, some basic proficiency in this so that you know um, we can actually work with you, right? Uh, we're trying to really build collaborations. And for that, it's good that other people also know uh, uh, what you're talking about and can contribute and uh, try out things that we build and that sort of thing. Um, and we, we require a minimal commitment to a project for a half a day per week. And again, this is to build the collaboration. So, so projects that you submit where you say, well, this is what I need to building. Can you please build it and let me know next year when it's done? We really find that these are not very successful projects. So that's why we have these requirements. We really uh, need you to uh, work with us, right? So that if we show you things we made and there's a, a agreement needed on the next steps and things must be tried out, maybe if we built a software that uh, that you can do to, to run simulations, uh, somebody will have to actually run the simulations and check the results, that sort of thing. So that's why we have this uh, minimum commitment requirement. Um, yeah, so here's the, the uh, table. I'll be, uh, um, again, it's, uh, it's uh, you can find it in the call as well. Uh, this actually is, uh, explains these two, uh, two calls in more detail. Uh, so I'll, I'll first do the, the left column. So the early career projects, uh, where, as I said, we require a PhD, um, um, but it also should be recent, right? So this is the early career. So it should be more than, uh, not more than six years ago. And we do have a, a uh, if you're a parent, we do have an uh, extension possible, so you can uh, apply for an extension um, in that way. Um, the contract should be for the duration of the project, uh, uh, demonstrating experience uh, and this commitment. And then there's the, the, the first, uh, I think, a rather unique thing about this uh, call, uh, that we require a software management plan. So uh, as you always mentioned, we really try to uh, make a lasting impact uh, and make something sustainable. Uh, and uh, uh, build communities for software. But that doesn't happen uh, by coincidence. You really need to work on this. So that's why we have this concept of the software management plan, which is basically uh, uh, requires you to think about where you will go next on uh, uh, with your software and how you will make it sustainable. And if this sounds a bit vague, uh, that's okay. Actually, Carlos is gonna give a presentation as part of this information meeting on what this actually is and how you should then actually uh, uh, fill this out. Um, projects last uh, uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, and uh, what actually the, the, the grant entails is uh, one and a half person years of support from our e-science uh, 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 engineers. Um, for the early career uh, project, it's okay if, uh, if you write it uh, with a lead applicant uh, and that's it. That's it. Uh, we do encourage actually to work this as part of a team uh, also on your side so that uh, the, the software actually has a higher chance of being sustainable and used. Um, there's this workshop. Uh, what's actually nice uh, from the early careers is that we actually have a, a agreement with the Lawrence Center to organize these workshops there. So if you happen to know what a Lawrence workshop is, then, uh, then actually uh, th this is what you're getting as part of the clear project. Um, the, the, the workshop submission itself is not part of the uh, of this proposal round or of the whole funding round. So once you once you get one of these projects, we can help you uh, write a proposal for that and submit it because they also have a proposal um, system. Uh, and we fund this for a maximum of 15,000 euros. Um, so what we do need for, from you is a clearly defined research challenge. And uh, we have these uh, following discipline areas. So there's life sciences, physical science and engineering and social sciences and humanities. And I do want to stress that this is our way of uh, dividing all of research. It's not a selection. So any field of research you're in fits in one of these three. Uh, it, it, it matches the ERC uh, way of organizing uh, research. Uh, so if you don't um, feel recognized in one of these terms, uh, then, then also you can talk to me and we can figure out which one actually suits you best. Uh, but what we use it for is to do the reviewing committees. Uh, and 
Um, and there's different uh, numbers of projects for the different uh, uh, fields, but it's not uh, in any way a selection. So you 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 won't uh, um, you won't have to worry that uh, that you don't fit in any of these. Um, then for the spirit projects, um, <clears throat> these are a bit bigger, so our requirements are also a bit uh, a bit bigger in that way. And they're also uh, uh, so first of all, they're meant for people with a permanent contract or a tenure track position. This is st still okay, also there. Um, uh, and the same holds for the, the, the experience, uh, this commitment, and the software management plan. Uh, these projects can be a bit longer. Uh, and also, uh, since they're a bit bigger, it makes sense to maybe make the project a bit longer. They also have two and a half uh, person years of uh, support from us rather than one and a half. Um, and there, uh, we really do require a team. And more specifically, we, uh, we require that it's actually a, a collaboration with more than one institute. So one of the members of this team should actually be from a different research institute than your own. And again, this is to really make sure that we build this community, that it's not that we built a piece of software specifically for a single researcher. And then the, the, the software uh, has a very low chance of becoming something sustainable. Um, the workshops in this case are actually two. Uh, and rather than uh, having the, the Lawrence Center co-organize these, uh, you can basically organize them yourself. So there's a maximum of 25,000 25, euros. Uh, there's a small procedure for uh, for getting this uh, uh, funds approved after the, again after the proposal. Um, and this is really helpful, we find, to, to really build this community. So one of these workshops could be on trying to get requirements from the community, uh, maybe slightly more to the beginning of the project, and then one can be slightly more to the end. Where you actually invite users to come and use your software, uh, or um, in other ways, kind of make it uh, help to make it more sustainable and grow the community. Uh, the same uh, um, same division among the disciplines, um, and um, there there's a slightly smaller amount of project as a result. So these are four, while uh, there's actually seven early career projects. So these are the the, the, the the workshops. As I said, uh, the, the early careers are organized uh, together with the Lawrence Center, while the spirits are actually organized by you. Um, and uh, again, we really try to use these to, to build a community, uh, to get people to, to use this, and hopefully also sign up to them doing part of the development of this software and part of the, the making it sustainable, right? You need people to maintain it, people to use it, people to do outreach, maybe write documentation, that sort of thing. So for that, you really need a, a community. So these are the, the, the steps. Um, as you always mentioned, really try to simplify the procedure, uh, but still, as we still want to make this, uh, of course, fair, uh, um, it is, uh, uh, well, so some steps are required. Uh, one thing we also optimize this process for is for effort. So we don't want 100 people to write us a proposal if we can only fund two. That's a waste of time for 98% uh, of everybody involved. Uh, so this is why we also uh, really try to make this as easy as possible and then uh, uh, do, a, do a selection uh, um, for, the, for the second round. It's a two round process. Uh, first a, a, a project proposition and then a full proposal. So the first step is the information event. Which already made it to, hooray. Um, it is, uh, by the way, uh, optional, this information event. So if uh, if somebody wants to submit this and uh, they, they didn't manage to get to this information event, it's fine. Um, the project proposition actually is uh, a single document. So it's a Word document. There's a template available on a website that you can fill out. Uh, there's no other documentation uh, needed in any way. Um, and uh, you can submit it via, via ISAC, which is the NWO submission system you're maybe familiar with, or because it's also used by NWO for all their uh, calls. Um, and um, what we do with these and why we have this round is that we would like to do an eligibility check, right? So, so there were some rules that I mentioned uh, previously on who can submit. So we actually do a check um on uh on if this applies and we also do a, a, a lightweight check on if the project you're proposing actually matches our our expertise uh adam would like to do a presentation on what the expertise of the e-science center so um if, if you happen to submit something that is really outside of our realm 
of, uh, of expertise and we won't be able to help you with it. It's kind of a waste of time for everybody uh, to do this. Um, and uh, that's why we do this check. And then uh, rather uniquely, I think, uh, we actually do a random selection of uh, eligible project propositions. So let's say we get a, a, a wildly oversubscribed call and we get uh, 17 times the number of uh, submissions that we actually have funding for, then we'll actually do a, a random selection to keep the, the, um, the number of submissions low uh, and to actually give you a reasonable chance of making it to the, to the, to the granting phase uh, if, you, if you submit a proposal. Uh, and again, we really don't uh, look at the content of these, right? There's no judging, there's no selection based on uh, the, the, the type of research or anything like that. Um, so um, then from this very short proposal, it's actually quite a uh, big step uh, uh, for the full proposal. And we noticed that uh, uh, a lot of researchers uh, actually would really like to talk to somebody from the Science Center to, to, to make this proposal as good as they can. Uh, so for this reason, actually, in our procedure, we have a built-in uh, system for this. It's the consultation sessions. Uh, we try to make this fair so uh, everybody gets the same amount of access to the, the, the experts at the eScience Center. And this is a, a, a one meeting where you can basically ask all the questions uh, you ever wanted to know. Um, there'll both be somebody that knows the procedure, but especially uh, people that know the content. We usually uh, do the selection also based on your uh, pre-proposal, right? So we'll make sure that, that whoever joins this consultation section uh, session actually uh, has expertise required for your uh, project. And uh, it's just friendly advice. So uh, in no way need you, do you need to follow this advice. Uh, uh, they basically try to, trying to help you make a good proposal. And also, uh, the people in this consultation se session uh, are then in no way uh, involved in uh, in the review of your proposal. There's also no written report of this that goes anywhere to uh, there's no report at all. Uh, so in that way, you can ask anything, right? There's no uh, no no way you can ask a dumb question. There's also no way that this influences the results. Uh, and in that way, we really hope to give you the biggest chance of of making a good proposal. Um, after that, uh, there's the full proposal round. Um, this is uh, slightly more involved than the pre-proposal, but we still try to keep it uh, lightweight. Um, so there's the, the full proposal document, which is uh, basically an extended version of the, the, the first uh, um, the proposition. Um, uh, and there's also a software management plan that you then need to fill in. Uh, hopefully by the time you've had the consultation session and uh, 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 you should be able, and by the time you saw the presentation by Carlos, you should be able to actually uh, see what you can, what you should fill there out, uh, fill out there. And we also have support letters that you can send, right? So one of the things that really makes software sustainable is a community. And uh, we thought that having support letters from the community then actually is a good way for you to show uh, that uh, that there is actually a community there and uh, people are willing to use this once it's finished or once it's better developed or whatever you're proposing in your proposal. Uh, but these, again, these are optional, right? So uh, so if you uh, if you're really trying to build something from scratch and the community is still very much in its infancy, I can imagine that you uh, uh, that you don't have these support letters. Again, submitting is via ISAC via pretty much the same uh, same way as the previous round. Uh, we then do an eligibility check, uh, which is the same check as the first check, uh, but uh, in case you change something in your proposal, we should make sure it's still valid, also that there's a valid software management plan. Uh, and something we do there is the software and data health check. So since 99% uh, of our projects actually start with existing software and existing data, we, uh, we don't do a quality check in terms of is this software quality good enough? but it should be something feasible to start with given what you're asking. Um, so uh, for instance, the licensing that's on software, if it's, uh, if it's not possible to change the software in any way, uh, if there's huge licensing fees involved with it, if it cannot be published open, uh, then, then that's something to check and also for the data. Uh, so we do a basic check to see if, uh, if, the, if the proposal really requires data, that this data is then actually available. Uh, but of course, if you uh, if you want to still collect data or that's something, it's also perfectly fine. Uh, but you should then put that in the proposal, right? That that's actually the first thing you'll do. 
And Adam will actually talk about uh, software and data health checks. Um, then there's a panel assessment. Uh, so this is very much done by, uh, by your peers. We have a, a mixed uh, panel uh, containing uh, domain experts. So people that really know uh, about the research you're trying to do and can assess if this is, uh, if this is uh, a good, uh, good research done and if this is the most urgent thing that, that needs doing in, in the field compared to the other proposals. Um, and uh, we do also have the e-science experts that, uh, that judge the, the te technical feasibility and uh, the viability of this uh, solution. And together, then they come up with a, a ranking. Uh, and uh, as many calls, this is a competition. So there's a minimum uh, 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 quality level. Uh, I think it's very good in this case. So anything that is judged very good or better is eligible. Uh, but then uh, there's still a, a ranking and uh, basically the top of the rank is uh, chosen. Um, and the awarding is then done by the eScience and the board on the basis of the um, advice by this uh, panel, uh, panel committee. Um, so here's the, the timetable. It's also on the website and in the call. As you can see now, the, uh, we're at the information event here. Uh, the deadline for the project proposition is the 16th of March at uh, 2 in the afternoon, which is uh, NDBO deadline time. Uh, for those of uh, you familiar with that, um, which is a rather short time actually uh, after now. But uh, as I said, we really try to make this as easy as possible. If you cannot write a proposition uh, in a couple of hours, given a good idea, then uh, then I think uh, we failed at our uh, um, at our task. Uh, and then you can uh, you can see the rest of the uh, the deadlines here. Um, the final decision is somewhere in November December timeframe. So then we really try to uh, to to give people uh, uh, in the news on if they they made a final proposal, uh, so that actually hopefully somewhere next year we can start these projects. Right. So this is from the the practical things. If you have any more practical questions, uh, you can ask me in the the Q and A session. Uh, you can put them in the chat in the meantime, uh, um, but you can also uh, ask uh, either me or some. Some uh, some is uh, involved from NBO side for the for the practical uh, matters uh, and the formal procedure, and you can always ask us via email, and we can plan a meeting if if something's really unclear. Um, so next in our information is the, the the this technical expertise, right? So so you want to have a proposal a uh, project with us. So who actually uh, what can you ask? What kind of expertise is then within the scope of the Sun Center? Uh, for that, Adam Bloom is here to uh, to present this. Uh, and uh, Adam, uh, take it away. And uh, if you need the next slide, let me know. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Niels. So uh, yeah, uh, I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about the, the technical expertise. So I think most of the point I had in mind I have already covered in the two previous talks. So I'm uh, just to make sure that uh, I'm a member of a small team at the eScience Center called Tech uh, Tech Leads. Uh, so our role at the eScience Center is to make sure that uh, the eScience always stay at the front end of the technology. So we are always using state-of-the-art technology. We also work across projects. So basically we are not assigned to one project, but we are assigned to multiple projects to make sure also that uh, technology, which is an expertise developed in a project could be reused by another project, either within the same domain or cross domain. Um, and uh, also we try to do usually forecast and see what uh, the technology is heading to make sure that the e-science always stays at the front end. So uh, we are working a lot with the, our uh, research software engineers and I have checked them this morning. Actually, we have on the, our website uh, 70 uh, research software engineer. So uh, you can see their profile on the, our website. You just uh, go and browse the website. Most of them, they have, uh, as uh, you already said, a PhD and have quite a long exper experience in research, either academia and some of them coming from industry. And um, uh, yeah, uh, can you go to the next slide? So just to show a little bit uh, what type of uh, expertise we have. I think it's not, ex or, um, I'm, I'm the, we, uh, you see, uh, we are covering quite a range uh, uh, of uh, technology, uh, digital technology expertise from machine learning to uh, high performance computing and uh, yeah, and many other computer scientists and software engineering expertise we have on board. But since our engineers are working 
most of the time in projects together with domain scientists, they also have developed quite a lot of expertise in a number of domains. Uh, something that we are trying to uh, improve is that to make sure that our uh, uh, research software engineers talk to, uh, and work together in a group. For now, they are like uh, organized in sections uh, depending on their expertise and also their interest. Uh, I think the, the, the sections have been mentioned by Nielsen, uh, natural sciences and engineering, life sciences, environment, sustainability, social sciences and humanities. Uh, yeah, most of our, yeah, some of our engineers have been working with us for, for quite a long time, I think, and have been involved in a large number of projects. And I think they are really uh, have good ex experience and expertise in both uh, the digital techniques and also the domain. So we don't claim that we cover all uh, sciences and all technologies, but at least we have quite wide range of expertise that could help you uh, to uh, yeah, conduct your project and hopefully end up with a, a very nice software, reusable, and it's one of the major uh, outcome we would like to get is to have the sustainability software. So software should not end at the end of the project. It should be easy to reuse and uh, uh, help the community after the project is uh, finished. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So a couple of years back, I mean, um, I think the eScience Center together with uh, uh, DANS, the uh, National Archive for Research Data have uh, launched the FAIR Software Initiative which give the five steps to, for, uh, to help you to make your software uh, um, fair and reusable. And in one of these steps that we are uh, having, um, su suggesting that it, the software should be accessible publicly. And actually the, that's what we are doing at the eScience Center. We are trying to uh, do it uh, for all the research developed in our uh, projects. Here you see just an example of uh, one of the projects that have been developed Usually most of our project will end up in something we call research software directory. Can you go back to the next slide? So, uh, yes, this is basically the, uh, I would say the mandatory end of most of the successful project outcome uh, when it comes to software. We publish all our software here and make them um, fair as uh, much as we can. It means the software should be uh, reusable, should be findable, and uh, should be easy to uh, to use in another project uh, by uh, the community. Everything has to be uh, available and open source. Uh, the, I think we, the eScience Center has invested a lot the last two years to make this software directory uh, uh, a very uh, good quality service and actually even like production environment for you. I think you can use it in two ways, either to find software. So uh, if you're not working with us, I think uh, I encourage you to go in there and search uh, and you might find uh, software that you are interested in and would like to use in your research. It says there it's open source. It has been for you developed. You can find all kinds of information about the software. Uh, from how to cite the software to the code, the link to the GitHub, to the person, the contact person who you can contact to get some information about and how to use it, documentation, papers, etc. Um, and of course, if you become uh, our collaborator in these projects, your software also will end up here. And of course, this is why we are talking about it. So the eScience is very proud of it. Uh, and then in all our talks, we talk about this uh, research software directory. I think then uh, the, you can see we have a, a link. It's very simple link, research software uh, dash dash directory dot org. And then you end up there and see the, our current uh, uh, offer. I mean, the project that have been developed. And actually this, I've checked this morning, the numbers here on this slide are already out of data. There are more projects, uh, more contribution, et cetera. Next slide, please. So I think the next two slides are just to tell, to give you an idea what you can find uh, uh, in the software, so how, how it looks like. So uh, I think you can uh, find software. Uh, how can you uh, uh, judge quickly if the software is easy, for, uh, is relevant to your use, etc. Um, I think you, by yourself, you can just go there and browse and see that it's quite, uh, you get quite, extensive information about the software we have been developing for the 
last uh, years. And hopefully when you finish your project, it will also look like this. Next slide, please. I think, that's, I think these are more just explaining uh, how the this software directory is organized to make your life easy for finding, searching, and uh, hopefully solving uh, your problem and finding the software you can reuse. Um, next uh, slide, I don't remember. Yeah, I think the same thing. Is. These are just details of the interface of the software uh, research directory. I think the last point I would like to briefly talk about has been already uh, covered by uh, Niels is this uh, software check and data check we do for uh, your proposals. Um, a, the idea is that, as it was mentioned, uh, that most of our projects start with a, a software that we you, you are interested to reuse uh, and uh, continue to develop. Um, and this, uh, the, 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 this initial check is just to make sure that there is a kind of synchronization between the objectives of the project you are writing and the quality of the software. So we make we do a very light check uh, for the data and also for the software to make sure that these two things are in sync. And actually this might help you to improve your, uh, so we can come back with, with some feedback that could help you to improve your proposal and get more chance to succeed at the end. Uh, you, sometimes, I mean, a simple uh, broken link in your proposal to a directory of the software might have an impact on the final results. So we might really, uh, really help you to improve. We're giving you some feedback uh, on these things. So from my experience, I mean, most of the time, uh, the, the we don't find major problem with the uh, software and checks and data checks. Uh, but if we find them, we just report them to the to the authors and they fix them before the final submission and things can get uh, hopefully better for the proposal. I think these are the, the things I wanted to cover. I think if you have more questions, I will be here to answer from uh, on behalf of the tech leads. That's it. Thank you, Adam. Yep. Um... No, I think uh, uh, thank you for that overview. And uh, to, to go back to the slide here, uh, as you can see, we're again uh, we're pretty broad. So uh, so most of the technology that you actually use in research, uh, you, we should be able to help you with uh, to a to a pretty advanced level. Um, so next uh, uh, is the software management plan. So uh, as you uh, as you uh, saw, this is one of the requirements uh, for the full proposal to actually write this software management plan. And before people are too scared of uh, how much uh, admin work this entails, uh, I'll leave the floor to, uh, to Carlos to actually explain uh, uh, what this is. Um, thanks, Nails. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay, yeah, perfect. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I'm just gonna explain a little bit briefly, how do we think about software management plans? I think the most important part that uh, Niels uh, has already mentioned, they're really meant to uh, make your software uh, better uh, in, in one way or another. So uh, in other words, if this is, uh, if we think about your software as being uh, the, the, the gears of, of what drives your uh, scientific process, if we go to the next one, uh, you can think of software management plan uh, as, a, so your software is some form of a, of, of a, a little plant, so next one. And that it has, uh, yeah, it, it has to flourish still, right? So the way that we think of software management plans, next one, is as the water that you would give a plant to make it, if we go next one, uh, to make it really reach its full potential. Uh, so the, this is just a, a little bit of a, a yeah, funny image to show what's the thought behind it, that we really uh, look at software management plans as a way to make your software better in whichever way we can uh, and to really try to make it uh, achieve the full potential that is not only useful uh, for yourself but like Niels mentioned already many times for the broader community and that it can live beyond the, the project in which it was developed. Uh, so if we go to the next one, um, basically last year we published these practical guides for software management plans uh, and in this document, we describe some of the core requirements that should be included in a software management plan. Um, but of course, 
this is for also all possible software uh, in, in, in science. So there's different types of software that you can think of. So you can think of uh, a small script that you use to analyze uh, a data that is coming from uh, some machine. Uh, that would be a, a type of software and that's okay. And uh, you need to manage that really uh, simple software maybe in a very simple way. But you can also think at the other end of the spectrum that you would have very complex software and that has a, a lot of uh, dependencies and a lot of libraries and that it really uh, a lot of people use that software in their research process every day and uh, that more complex software uh, you need to have a more um, thorough more detailed management plan so you have to think a lot more how am i going to make sure that this software continues to work in the next year next years so there's a, we, we think about the, the software being in uh, somewhere in in the spectrum from very simple to very complex and from very easy to manage to very uh, uh, elaborate to manage. So this needs, needs to be incorporated and this is part of what you should think about. Where is my software? How, how much, how critical is it? How, how, uh, how much effort should I put into making sure it continues to be uh, available in the future? Uh, and uh, how can we what components should be included in there uh, and more, more most importantly is uh, that we think about software management plans that they shouldn't be another bit uh, of administration uh, like uh, neil said is not it, it shouldn't be something uh, that oh it's management uh, it's boring it's something that has to be done but it really should be something that helps you think about your software think about what you need for your software and think uh, how, think about how you can make your software better and Hopefully, this is a discussion that we can have as a team and we can um, talk together about making a plan on how to make your software uh, better in the future. So if we go to the next slide, uh, we can look at some of the requirements that are uh, in, this, uh, in these guidelines uh, are in, in, in this picture. Uh, so one of the most important things here is the purpose of your software. You should always try to think what is the purpose of my software? Who am I building this for? Uh, who is the intended audience of my software? And, and uh, what am I planning to do with it? So that will help you really try to contextualize where is it in the spectrum uh, from very simple analysis software to very high maintenance uh, software. Uh, and then there's different requirements like uh, the engineering requirements, documentation requirements, and project uh, management requirements, which depending on on the type of on where your software sits in the spectrum you you may need some of these components or or maybe all of them or maybe just a few of them so things like version control uh, are probably useful for every type of software uh, throughout the spectrum same thing for user documentation uh, and maybe software licensing uh, but more advanced uh, engineering requirements like packaging or, or uh, might not be necessary for a, if your software is only just an analysis script. Um, so some, some of these requirements are a little bit like a pick and choose uh, depending on where your software sits in, the, in this spectrum. Uh, if we go to the next one, Niels. Uh, so th this is a, um, um, I guess a screenshot from the software management plan uh, template that we use for for our call um, uh, version 2023 so that's the most up-to-date one um, and then the, this is just so, so you have an idea of what type of questions are in the software management plan and what could uh, possible answers would be there uh, so for example as I mentioned, you should state the purpose of your software, and that's actually the first question on the template. Please provide a description of your software stating its purpose, intended users, and uh, uh, community. Uh, so this really should help you start thinking about, okay, if I'm developing this piece of software, who is going to use it, and what will this person need uh, to reuse the software when they, when they uh, pick it up and, and start using it. Uh, so that will maybe you can start thinking, well, then I will need to have some user documentation and some 
maybe installation instructions and maybe some requirements that uh, are necessary for the software. Uh, and that, that will start your, uh, soft, uh, your, your thought process on how to manage your software. Um, then the, there's other questions like uh, what measures will be taken during the project to ensure the long-term sustainability of the software de developed in your project. So uh, this really starts to think, okay, what can I do during the project that will make my, my software more sustainable? Uh, what can I do after the project that will ensure that my software continues to, to work? And what resources do I need uh, to, for my software to continue working? So, uh, for example, if you need your software to be, um, if your software is hosted in uh, a server, how am I going to make sure that that server continues to run and that a somebody continues to pay for that server and that uh, if I need to have some storage, that I continue to have that, that storage and maybe if I need to do updates in the server, how am I going to make sure that there's someone who can help me update the server? So uh, here is where you could think, uh, um, about things like, well, during the project, I'm going to build this uh, piece of software into one of my teaching modules. So this software will be used for, for our teaching at my department. And the IT services of my uh, university can help me to host it in our university server. And they, will, they can help me uh, install updates on the, on the server so that my, my software will continue to run in the next five years. Uh, so these are the, the, the type of things that you can start thinking, how am I going to, to use it and how am I going to uh, develop my software in a way that will uh, ensure that it continues to be uh, useful uh, many years uh, after the project has finished. Um, yeah, so that, that also connects to the, 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 the last questions, what measures can be taken to promote the software's longevity? Um, um, yeah, so I th as I mentioned, the, this document shouldn't be seen as a, a piece of, of administration that needs to be completed for getting your grant, but really it should help you think about how can I plan my project in a way that I will build software that is useful not only to uh, during the project, but that also after the end of the project, it, it will continue to be something that I can reuse and that other researchers can also benefit uh from uh, the research and hopefully that in in some way if it benefits the the wider research community the wider research community will also be willing and interested to uh, contribute with you to co uh, collaborate with you in maintaining the software and to continue uh, building on top of your of of your research so that your the products of your research will continue to be used um afterwards uh, uh, we'll have one more presentation by Hilke Anema of SURF who will explain uh, the, the different e infrastructure available from SURF uh, that you can perhaps uh, consider using in your, uh, in your projects. Uh, we actually have a question in our proposal on the, on the type of infrastructure you would like to use and how you think you could acquire this. So this should be excellent information for that. Uh, Hilke, take it away. Thanks, Can everyone hear me? Quite okay, it's a bit soft, but it's okay. Okay, I'm trying to be a little bit closer, I will presentation mode. I'm currently at the TU Eindhoven, so I'm not in my own uh, environment. Um, so my name is Jilke Annema. Uh, I work at SURF. As Niels mentioned, I'm a relationship manager for SURF's research services. Uh, I do this for the university sector, so I'm in touch with research IT departments, mainly at the Dutch universities. And I also have colleagues from other to other sectors such as the HBOs, University Medical Centers, and the Dutch Research Centers, centers such as KNMI. If you want to get in touch with them, please let me know and I will give my contact details. So what I will do today briefly is take you through uh, the services that SERV offers in the field of research. But first of all, uh, what type of organization is SERV? Um, we are a membership organization the members of our organization is the Dutch higher education and research field. So all Dutch universities are a member of our organization. Uh, most HBOs, uh, research centers, university medical centers, etc. And together with the institutions, we, uh, we decide what uh, 
uh, services and facilities we offer, but we also drive IT innovation in the field of education and research independence. So we're not a commercial organization uh, who offers the services. And I think it's uh, important to, uh, to emphasize that. So specifically with regards to research, these are the building blocks that we have for the research services. And by the way, if there are questions, I can't see anything else on the screen. So please uh, do that through Niels because I can't see the chat screen right now, or we can do it at the end of the if not. So I think the most important services that we offer for you guys are uh, compute services and data management services. And other than that, we also have some custom services and services in the field of trust and identity and connectivity. But this, of course, all depends on your uh, research needs. And this presentation will be shared by you, Niels, with everyone here. And it is full of links, as you can see on this next slide. Uh, I'm not an expert on compute, for example, myself, but you can just click on all the links and go directly to the web search web pages where there's more inf information on each uh, service. So first, uh, compute and custom services. When you are in need of more compute power than your own laptop, we offer uh, a variety of options. Uh, we have the Dutch uh, supercomputer, Snellius, uh, on premises, where you can get access to if you have a really high demand uh, for, uh, for data processing. But we also offer other various, various other solutions, depending on your research needs. For example, Surf Research Cloud is a very flexible computing infrastructure if you need just a little bit more than just uh, one core, for example, you can apply for access to Surf Research Cloud and do the computation and tasks uh, there. And we also offer custom services where uh, if you have a very uh, complicated data or very uh, complicated questions, we can help you with data analysis, visualization, artificial intelligence stuff, uh, etc. Please click on all these links and you will go directly to the right website. Um, and where we have uh, our own uh, HPC facilities, Snellius and Lisa, as I mentioned, uh, we also offer through Surf Cumulus access to uh, public clouds or commercial clouds. So if you have a preference for doing the computational tasks at Azure or AWS or Google, you can also access that through our services. And uh, this uh, gives you the discounts that we also receive because we buy uh, the access here cheaper. Um, so how does that work if you want to have access to our compute services? First of all, you can just apply for a pilot grant. A pilot grant is free, so it doesn't cost you anything. And you can apply for a short project for a maximum of young, uh, one year. And you will get a limited amount of compute, uh, data storage uh, included and uh, support from SURF as well included in this uh, pilot. So we will help you set, uh, set you up, decide what system is the best to use, and then you can start running your uh, computational tasks. And if you need more, there's always the option of uh, going to NWO and applying for a, a grant there for large scale research projects. And uh, I should specify that these are usually huge projects, as you can see, uh, right here. So we're talking about thousands and thousands of cores that are needed. Some organizations also have, also have direct access to our uh, compute facilities through a so-called RCCS contract, but not every organization does it. And actually, I'm not sure Niels who the main public is here. Is this university people or other sectors as well? University mainly. Uh, for example, the VU and the UVA, uh, Rotterdam, uh, Eindhoven, they have access uh, through this way, but some others do not. So if there's no access through your institution, then you should apply directly uh, through SURF uh, by the, the two ways I mentioned previously. We also have open calls if you want to use public clouds. So and, uh, again, here you can apply. It's usually cost-free uh, because the, the, the costs are already covered by the Ministry of Education. And we offer a whole lot of data management services. Um, I'm not going to run through all of these uh, because it really depends on, uh, on your specific research setup, on the type of data that you are using, and what stage of your data lifecycle you are, uh, what service can be used. 
But I think it's important to note that many of the services are also included in our compute services. For example, if you use Snellius, our uh, supercomputer, of course, you will also get data storage together with that uh, compute service. Oh, my screen goes away. It's my mouse. I'm sorry. Uh, and also, if you use, for example, our HPC cloud, uh, maybe there, uh, you can connect that with a serve service uh, that you have at your home institution, such as Serve Research Drive uh, or Yoda. That little data life cycle picture that you see below, I have a newer version here, which is a little bit more complete. And you can see that we pretty much cover the whole uh, research data life cycle. Um, it should be noted, however, that some of these services are usually offered through your uh, central IT department at the university. It specifically applies for uh, Surf Research Drive, IRLS, and Yoda hosting, for example. So that's a service that you cannot uh, apply for and serve directly but should be applied for at your own university, usually through your IT department. And other services, such as our data archive or object storage, those are usually uh, coupled to our compute services. So it's a bit more of a, uh, a bit more complicated picture here than for our compute services. But again, if you have questions, let me know. Um, then we also offer services in the field of trust and identity, and the, the fourth one here is the most important, which is Surf Research Access Management. And this allows uh, a group of researchers uh, to set up their own environment uh, through one single uh, login system. You can include uh, all the researchers you want from your own institution, you can include students, you can include people from other uh, universities, but also people from industry or government. And then you will be sure that they are all in the same environment and can make use of the data that you put in there, the compute power that you put in there. And it's a very safe way of assuring that only the right people, the people that you want to have access to your data, uh, can work uh, with this data. And this is a service that is fairly new, and most universities do offer it, however, not uh, actively. So if you think that this is something for you, Please talk to your IT and ask them to set up a uh, SROM, as we call it, Surf Research Access Management account. Then this is connectivity. If you this is interest uh, interesting, if you have huge amounts of data, and we're talking about tera and terabytes of data, and you want to uh, send them from one point to another, we offer Dictpad and other ways uh, to connect uh, with your data. Find out more on the links on that uh, our website. And then finally, we do offer we offer a lot of uh, procurement for IT uh, and for services. Uh, I mentioned Surf Cumulus, which gives you, gives you access to cloud services, for example, from Azure or Google. Uh, but we also do procurement for uh, access to uh, research information, Elsevier, Springer, Wiley, etc. Usually through your library, so this is not directly uh, serve for you as a researcher. Uh, but I thought it would be good to let you know that this is the, uh, one of the other things we are doing for researchers. And we also have open innovation labs. Uh, these start out with a group of people from SURF who are working on the innovation of services, usually with researchers who are interested in one of these themes. And then together they will uh, just uh, experiment within a, a lab situation and uh, see if new technology or new applications can come out of this. And uh, this is a list of the current open innovation labs that we have. Uh, as you can see, two are already finished. Uh, the others are still running. Uh, quantum computing, for example, is a, is a very interesting one, which you can, you can apply for access to uh, AWS's uh, quantum computer. It's a Google, I'm not sure. Um, so if you are interested in any of these fields, uh, go to the website. You can, and last but not least, uh, SURF also offers events, training, workshop, uh, all depending on your needs and all be found on our, uh, on our website. We offer consultancy, for example, done a consultancy on the field of virtual research environments uh, last year. And we bring together expertise, usually from uh, research support uh, people. For example, in the national coordination point for research data management, so that we can that we can exchange experiences between institutions. 
I was dead by then by presentation. And this was very briefly. I realized that uh, I hope I've told you something that was interesting for you. Um, if there are any questions, you can do that now or you can send me an email uh, later in my email address. Thank you, Hilke, for this uh, nice presentation. Uh, I hope it was uh, audible for everybody. That the sound was not great. Uh, I hope uh, we'll try to polish it a bit also when we, uh, when we publish the recording so you can uh, always watch it back there. Um, uh, yeah, and I want to mention that uh, uh, for our proposals, we require you to, to fill out uh, what kind of infrastructure do you need and how will you do acquire these. This doesn't mean you need to be an expert on anything uh, uh, on all those infrastructure to submit something. If you say, I need a computer about this big and I'm not quite sure, uh, quite sure uh, what it should be, you can always contact me if you would like a little bit more information. Uh, we can also put you in contact with SURF. But it's also quite common for us to actually, uh, during a proposal, uh, work with the scientists uh, to actually then do the actual submission uh, of these proposals, right? So it's uh, also something we can help you with in the project. You don't have to do this first uh, before you can submit. Right. Um, then the, this uh, this leaves us for the last uh, the last uh, section of this meeting, namely the the Q and A. Uh, I'll actually turn off the recording. Um, so uh, thank you for watching if you're watching the recording.